Coming up on FRC Recap, first takes a stand on racism with a social media post. Off-season competitions may still be live in 2020. Annie Mark is doing some restructuring, and Adam Hurd from 254 joins us to talk operating in the replay era. We'll give our community shout-out of the week and play Take from Fun Trivia, where the current prize is $50. All this coming up on FRC Recap. Giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And also, viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to the FRC Recap, where you get the breakdown and discussions on what's going on in the FRC community. For first updates now, I'm Tyler Olds. And I'm Dave Powers. Our guest tonight needs a little introduction from his work with Powerhouse Team 973 to his OAS comical Chief Delphi posts. He's been in the FRC game since 2004. Please help me in welcoming our guest from the tech capital of the world, <laughs> Adam Hurd. Thanks for having me, guys. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, Adam, delighted to have you on. Lots of stuff to talk about the show. Let's jump in with our headlines. So last week, uh, first posted their social media platforms a statement, and uh, specifically on Instagram, a little bit more, you saw the black square image uh, on there with the following statement. We stand against racism and hatred, and we stand together in, sol in uh, sol man, pronunciation, sol solidarity with the black community and all those who are, who are feeling hurt right now. We're pausing to make room for other voices to be heard. Together, let's keep building a better future. Black Lives Matter. Uh, something to also note too, first has po postponed the FTC game teaser release in response to this posting as well. Uh, and first is still looking for a director of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, after the departure, the departure of Sheila Henderson in April. You can find out more about this posting and more about first stance at firstinspires.org. Up next, we got Stepbotics.io. For years, the ma mainstream go-to for basic insights into FRC has always been the Blue Alliance, and now a new powerful tool has hit the web. Stepbotics.io just released their site and is monitor monitor monitorizing, I can't say that word, modernizing FRC data analytics. Currently focus on ELO rate rankings. Um, check it out now and see how the team compares to some of the best in the world. See the year-over-year -year improvements your team has made compared to the compare your teams to compare your team to your friends' teams for bragging rights and even predict the outcomes of match with plans to add more content related to OPR event predictions and Zebra Motion Works data. This site is sure to become a powerful FRC data tool, and you should check it out now. Adam, looks like you might have upgraded with the 254 based on this. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, versus 973 on here. Oh, gotcha. Uh, so even though FIRST has stated that they will not support uh, off-season events officially, last week Team 1577 Steampunk from Israel dropped a huge announcement that they will be running three competitions to make up for the, the missed events in Israel. The Golden Gears events will have two back-to-back -back events and also a grand finale that they are calling the Israeli Festival of Champions. All that stings a little bit. The <laughs> event is only available to teams in Israel and is scheduled uh, to run in early August. Yeah, one of the things we'll be talking about later is uh, if we uh, might be seeing events anywhere else, not just you know in the U.S., which might not be a possibility, but perhaps somewhere else in the world. Uh, some unfortunate news, by the way, Andy Mark has made a decision to downsize their workforce uh, over the past weekend. Uh, we did reach out to Andy Mark, and Mary Baker responded that approximately 18% of their workforce was reduced. Uh, this included voluntary layoffs, choosing not to fill open positions, and also positions that, quote, we could shift responsibilities for the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, so lots going on uh, with that. Mary does state that Annie Mark uh, knows the next, quote, uh, 12 to 16 months won't be easy, but we are committed uh, to our staff and to our customers to make sure Annie Mark survives. We are looking at new markets and have received some ideas from our customers. 
Uh, if you're interested in uh, helping support Andy Mark, by the way, and, and you know on Fun, we're really big on helping support the suppliers. Uh, as you go through, you can refer uh, your local law enforcement to Transcend Tactical, which is a stair climbing robot. You can start an FRC uh, or FTC team as anything you do to expand first will benefit suppliers. Uh, and this is coming from Andy Mark, um, what we can do for those things. Uh, and you can look for more information on their Skitter classroom robot in the coming weeks. Um, might hear we have some of that coming up soon, some more information for you. Uh, I know that many of us, by the way, have friends on Andy Mark. I definitely do uh, for things. So it's always uh, uh, something we don't want to see in the community, uh, no matter what for that. Uh, but uh, you know, all we can do is wish Andy Mark the best. They're a company I think is going to be really resilient and I can't wait to, uh, you know, see how they come out of this. And I, I know it's going to be in the right way. So Andy Mark, uh, hopefully you're listening. Uh, good luck to you on that. And I, I really do hope things work out well for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, moving right along now, we can talk a little bit about the new First Inspires website layout. So First has a refreshing new look on their website. If you go to firstinspires.org, you'll see the new nav bar and the layout tailored to the first Game Changers theme for the next season. If you scroll down a bit, you may have noticed First home learning page where teams can participate uh, in the First at home activities, remote learning resources, and more. So if you're bored, stuck at home, or have team members that are unable to check out uh, make sure you check out these activities that can be done both as a team and at the individual level. And that is our headlines. All right. So moving right along into the main stories, um, Adam, you kind of talked a little bit about the Israeli offseason competitions. Um, so now I think it's it would be good to just kind of have a conversation. Uh, do you think we will see other competitions happening outside of the United States as these countries are lifting uh, some of the restrictions. Do you think maybe we'll see something in China or something in Turkey? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually talking to a couple of buddies a couple of weeks ago and said I think the first competitions we'll see are in Israel. So it you know feels good to be right there. Uh, but yeah, I think these these isolated communities in other countries are the first spots we're going to see off season events and and maybe even the only spots we get to see any off season events at all. Yeah, definitely. I think my hope is that. Uh, as a lot of these different countries and stuff, kind of the cases are uh, tapering off and it's becoming safer and safer environment. I think that uh, it would be really cool to see kind of these communities come together. I know uh, that the uh, that competition stated that they're gonna be putting together a wooden playing field for all of the teams to, to, um, to play on. Obviously his first has uh, decided not to support any of the off-season events and sending out the field. Um, but I think even with it just being those wooden playing fields, it's still going to be an awesome opportunity for all of the teams that didn't really get to play uh, play yet or haven't just even haven't gotten on a field to kind of hang out, see the other teams, all of those teams. They're just, if you haven't gotten out and play and you haven't gotten to see any of the robots in real life yet. So it could be a good opportunity for them uh, with the risk being low. Yeah, one of the things that, um, in specifically with Israel, something I mentioned with that too is that, um, you know, Israel right now is focused on they, they call it the Israel Festival of Champions, right? So it's obviously going to involve teams from Israel, uh, but even if it didn't, you would not see other teams from other countries there because Israel still has a travel ban on uh, mm. any any team or not any teams, but any people from outside of Israel, unless you are a, uh, a citizen of Israel, or I think you, there's one other exception if you have some sort of housing or business there or something like that. So. <laughs> Uh, one of the things uh, uh, the mention, I, I think some other areas, I, I do think Turkey might be a candidate uh, that we might see, and actually potentially China, as China has, uh, you know, it, from what we can tell, or at least the information that we have for these things, uh, has seemed to contain most of the stuff that I, I do think there could be potential there. And I think, you know, like countries like t China and Taiwan, uh, where they didn't get a chance to play any events, uh, there's, there's no reason. I mean, geez, if you've been that, like I went to China a couple of years ago and they can essentially mimic or they like completely copy what robots look like. They can copy the <laughs> FRC playing field just fine and create yeah. uh, new ones. Yeah, that. Absolutely. So, so, uh, I think really the question comes down to, and, and Adam, maybe that, the asking and follow up, is there any chance we might see events in the States happen this year? For the off season specifically, you're saying? Yes. Oh man, I you, you got to think there's uh, some places farther away from water that that'll probably end up doing it, but uh, I'm not. I, I don't think it's likely we'll see off seasons in in most of the higher density team areas. Um, uh, and and you know especially with you know in theory, uh, spread being 
a, a lot worse, you know, as we enter the the fall and winter. So it just doesn't seem likely with with all the current numbers. Dave, what about you? Do you think it's uh, could it happen? Yeah. So somebody mentioned in the chat, and this was also the kind of thought that I have. So like. Um, the whole FMS and the field management system, I think, might be the hard part for a lot of these independent. Sure. Um, a lot of these independent competitions. So I'm not exactly uh, I'm mostly a hardware guy over here, so I don't exactly know how the whole field setup works and if you can get an independent system um, going on that. So I think that might be the limiting factor for a lot of communities if it is safe. Um, I think my brain would kind of want to, uh, if we weren't playing this game again next year, I think it might be a good push to play again. But since we're going to get the opportunity, everybody's going to get to use those robots again next year, um, kind of deferring and playing, being on the safer side in the United States since uh, you never really know what could happen in the next three or four or six months. So it might be better to just kind of uh, wait it out and not not push the issue by having these these unofficial off-season events sure and little shameless plug if you really are gunning to play some infinite recharge uh there is the xrc sim which you can play online multiplayer mm. go check that out is it's a lot of fun we do air it quite frequently on fun uh as well and i'll just wrap up saying yeah i i do think it's unlikely we'll see any events in the states happen uh i i do think that if the event happens in israel as planned i think it will set an interesting precedent for other areas that might want to copy or or run an event like what safety precautions are they taking there uh how many people are going to be there is everybody wearing masks you know and that might not be important in israel right realize different countries are going to have different ways of approaching something like this uh so it will be interesting to see uh, how they tackle it and then will other areas potentially emulate the same thing as well mm-hmm. Um, so earlier, we also talked about the uh, statbotics.io uh, uh, platform on here. And I really want to bring this up because I want to ask you guys, obviously, this, this is a cool platform. There's a lot of things we can look up in the history uh, of things. I know something that I love to use a lot is uh, insights from the Blue Alliance uh, and what they have. But uh, I want to ask you, Adam, what have, what other types of platforms have you tried out or using or things you might have in-house on 254 or 973 of the past? Um. So, you know, it's really cool to see this come out because previously my secret is, you know, whatever obscure scouting thing I wanted to have happen, I would message Rachel Lim on Chief Delphi, ask her to do it, say it has to be done in Google Sheets. She would always reply that she was really busy and see what she might be able to make happen. And then the next day, this like flawless solution with, you know, supporting evidence uh, w- would be sent back to me. So that was not, you know, something that could really be scaled to a lot of other teams. So it's cool to see more resources like this available. Uh, for teams to use, you know, especially for the match predictions. I think uh, n- not enough teams right now when they're doing their, their pick list meetings, or maybe it's not pick list, it's just that strategy meeting that night, they're looking at predicted rankings to, you know, make that meeting go a little more efficiently. So having this, like, democratized uh, match predictions is pretty sweet. But uh, uh, I can't share the, the 2D4 secret sauce. There's, oh, there's well, you know, we can ask. That, so. <laughs> that Pat has done, uh, and I don't know what I'm authorized to talk about, so I'll, I'll pass on we, that. We authorize you to talk about anything here on FUN. That's that's what we encourage <laughs> here from an environment standpoint. So, uh, Dave, how about you? Uh, uh, anything on mechanical advantage uh, you guys have used or uh, either in-house or uh, uh, through other programs potentially? Oh, you are muted, though. We'll get a muted thing in chat. Uh, we'll see if we can get Dave back up in just a second. Um, one thing I'll, I'll say that uh, I just love seeing more of these open source options available, uh, the teams out there. And and there's been a couple others we've seen. Obviously, Caleb Sykes uh, with uh, doing things like the ELO ratings and what he's done for the community I think is absolutely amazing that – once again, somebody just coming out and benefiting the community. I think that's one of the great things about FIRST, uh, and in, in uh, particular FRC in many cases, is that you have, uh, you know, everybody's very much more open than what they used to be. I mean, I think about, uh, you know, my first year was uh, 2001, right? And I think about back then when Chief Delphi was around, believe it or not, and teams were very, very secretive almost all the time on how things went out, when they were released, that sort of thing. And there are still some teams that do that, and, that, and that's fine. Teams can choose to do whatever they want for all I care. Uh, well, I'm not on a team, so they really can do whatever they want. But, uh, you know, the thing I'll say with that is that it seems like a lot more open things have happened. A great example, Dave, the open alliance that you guys uh, have been uh, part of as well, too, uh, has really been uh, spreading the word a lot. Yeah. Can you hear me now? We can, sir. 
Okay, so yeah, on um, 6328, we put a lot of effort into the the in-house statistics and stuff like that, kind of putting together OPR rankings for matches and stuff like that, and then releasing them. Um, so the whole Statbotics uh, IO concept, I, I love that and the potential for it to become like a, an open source thing for uh, teams at competitions to be able to get real-time data uh, prior to going into making... Um, making their decisions. I think that it's kind of going to lack a little bit until it gets a lot of the, um, a lot of the like OPR and the, the real data and not just ELO. Cause there are a couple like weird things with ELO. If a team's in a, a district that, that uh, is a little bit harder and there's a lot of really good teams in there, it kind of ranks teams weird um, just from my understanding of it. But I think as it grows and gets bigger, I think that this will be, this will be a really good resource for teams that might not have, um, like an incredible amount of resources in house to put together that statistics data um, and that scouting data to be able to utilize and just take their whole scouting to a whole nother level and uh, supplement the data that they're getting at the actual competitions themselves. Yeah, and for these games where, uh, you know, the first is providing scoring data per mm -hmm. element, you know, or type of element, especially now that they're counting hangs in end game, you know, like discreetly to each team. Um, and then also having the the scoring not be that mutually exclusive, it's actually really nice, the OPR data that's coming out. So mm -hmm. teams can get pretty good data sets without counting a single thing themselves. Plus, uh, one yeah. last thing, sorry, plus a zebra uh, factor, you know, that's starting to be put on. I, I would say we're probably going to see more of that in the future, I would think, as well, too, right? Yeah, I think that that zebra stuff is going to be awesome because you can tell the teams that kind of, like, know what they're doing, right? Or they're just, like, driving around circles and not... It'll be it'll be cool to see all of this data. I love I love the like real um, the real data driven decisions and stuff like that. So I think that'll that'll supplement it. Um, all right. So now we can kind of walk our way over to our guest discussion. Um, so Adam, we kind of brought you here today, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, talk a little bit about um, tips for your team to operate in the replay era, right? So we know that first is going to be replaying our game for next year. Uh, the same game. Um, so what do you think will uh, help teams become successful in this uh, this day and age of where we're going to be playing the same game? So you get an opportunity to kind of see some some stuff already have happened. And uh, what do you think can teams can do um, to kind of take themselves to the next level given this opportunity? Uh, so first, I'll provide a little information. I was talking to a senior mentor last week, and they told me, the you know first has been telling regional directors and senior mentors that they can tell team this but the field elements aren't changing the balls aren't changing there will be no changes to, to anything like that at all and they're just going to be doing like iri style uh you know rule changes so everything will be you know kind of in that vein or less um you know which is not something i had seen publicly stated by first yet and their statement you know a month ago or whenever that was uh was a lot more big than that but uh mm -hmm. I, I was told I could share this, so so we're doing that. Yeah. Um, no, so awesome. with that, um, you know, I, I think there's going to be a temptation, uh, kind of like every year on kickoff, for teams to do absolutely too much. Um, and now that you have so much more time available, like you kind of have this faux off season and then a season again, you have so much more runway to do absolutely too much, which is which is not good. So you know, if, if you skip the next ten minutes, I would stress do less. Um, if we want to do like a really brief summary of you know what I think you should do in each of these phases for the off season and unless you were a team that was already making new robots or like pretty substantial rebuilds in previous seasons because that fit well with your resources and what your team was doing I, I wouldn't do that I would not make new stuff this fall uh, for a lot of reasons between access to your shop um, and just you know you don't know what those real changes are you know we, we, it sounds like they'll be pretty small but there, you know there's a chance you're going to put resources into something that just isn't super valuable but but I do think um, teams really should focus on, on tuning, optimization, programming, practice, that sort of thing in the fall. Most teams have a robot that is not competing at 100%. You know, they're well mm -hmm. below 100%. Um, and I think like a good data point for this, the hype, you know, my, my old team and, you know, new favorite team, 973, I think, <laughs> ended the season like 10% higher than anyone else on OPR. And that is, I, I love them. I love the team. But like that is a 2012 robot. There is nothing innovative on there. There was nothing fancy on there. 
I think I saw 500 other teams post that same robot this year. Like it was tall, it had a shooter, the intake was on the other side of the shooter. Like that was the level of innovation and optimization was there. And, you know, they were just kicking the shit out of some people. I'm sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to cuss on this show. Uh, we'll call you on the chat. They worry. showed up ready and optimized and tuned. So, you know, most teams are not hitting that level of optimization and having this fall as like kind of a low pressure time to just go in there and practice and then have the programmers come in another day and fix stuff and that sort of thing, I think is a, is a great time to improve those skills. Um, to jump ahead to season, I think, you know, teams are going to be tempted to do too much. They're going to feel like they have to do a rebuild to be competitive because everyone's going to use this time and be super better and all that. Um, and that's probably not going to happen. So if you're going to rebuild, which I, I don't think most teams should do, um, I would avoid trying to copy you know, those top five and ten flashy teams. I would avoid going low if you're currently tall. I would avoid adding a turret. I would avoid adding a buddy climb, that sort of thing. Um, if you're really, really keen on rebuilding, I think there's there's three architectures I really like. So you know, one, that 9731 is great. Like, I mean, just about any team can make that. And there's gradients on how complicated you want to make it. You know, 973 was shooting from pretty far. You can make that same robot and just shoot from four feet away and, you know, easily make a limbs at most events if you're ready. Um, if you absolutely have to go short, which, I, you know, I don't think most teams should do, Dave on 6328 here, I love that robot. It's kind of like, you know, you took 2056, 2016 and just, you know, made the tweaks necessary to play this year. Super simple, doesn't have any extra features. That's a great one. And then one we didn't get to see play, unfortunately, and they released this, like, absolutely disgusting and embarrassing reveal video, probably the worst reveal video of all time. <laughs> uh, team 498 made an every bot that, uh, like, was, was, like, eight inches short of being able to hit the high goal uh, with a bag motor on their intake. So, they, you know, just make that a bigger, better motor, play with the roller some, and the every bot can make high goal shots, you know, two balls wide, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another really easy robot to make. So, I mean, and I would even advise teams that made robots more complicated than these three data points this year actually rebuild simpler, if anything, mm -hmm. um, if they really have that itch and just see what, you know, a year of focusing on tuning, optimization, practice, that sort of thing can get you. Because uh, I, I think you'll be surprised at, at how much more that pays off than, you know, a slightly better architecture or feature. A uh, question from chat, uh, let's see if we can take here. Uh, Adam from uh, NLS and GRN uh, says, how do you keep mechanical team happy with just practice, optimization, and programming? Ooh, that's tough. Uh, I mean, I would argue that all of those details are part of the mechanical design challenge. Um, and I mean, that, that might take a while to, to twist people's arm and convince them of that. Um, there's also a lot of opportunity to locally like in place, improve system. So you can still make a whole new intake that is you know, similar in form factor to your existing one, works a lot better, and leverages the rest of the robot really working well. You can still make a whole new shooter. You know, I would say most shooters last year probably weren't fully optimized. You probably can't get them to the level that would be necessary to play at the super high level without cutting some new parts and playing with that. So I think th there's a lot mechanical can do, but it's gonna be more on that optimization side and less on let's make a whole new robot. But like the skill in first, I think it's overhyped how much having the right architecture is uh, for most teams. You know, you get to that last like top five teams, you know, there's some real magic they pull off. But, you know, most really competitive teams, half of first draws that robot on the whiteboard day one. And like you're not surprised by what people bring, but it's how well teams implement that and how much they optimize it that, that really sets them apart. And me mechanical really needs to play a part of that. You know, there's, you know, a lot of intakes are just bad and it's a mechanical problem. Software and practice won't make it better. There's things mechanical has to do to improve it. So, Dave, on your end, uh, you know, piggybacking off of Adam, what are you going to take in regards to mechanical advantage uh, moving forward in regards to how you're going to operate in the replay era? Yeah, so pretty much exactly what Adam said in terms of like it does. I don't think it makes sense um, for a lot of these teams to be rebuilding and trying to like build that like top one percent, two percent robot it just kind of makes more sense for teams to sit down and utilize this time being like okay the build season's technically like i don't even know how long it is now but if we are given that time from it's the infinite. beginning <laughs> yeah infinite it makes sense to like build to a certain point and say okay um this is it now let's put in the effort to make the incremental upgrades to each subsystem that is gonna take those teams that, are, that do it so so well that like you got to think of the teams that do that go out every single year and they just like stomp everybody, right? It's not because they're building anything. Like, sure, the robots are probably a little bit more complicated, but they're not 
vastly superior um, in terms of like mechanical design. It's just their optimization of every system. Like, um, so I'll take 2168 for an example. They have, so I see them every year. They kind of always design something that's a little bit weird, but then they just keep iterating on it every single year. Actually, 195 is probably a better example of that, where every year they build something that's insane. I talk to Bailey Call all the time and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> and he, and then they just like, they make it work. And they're a perfect example of utilizing the extra time that they're given to just continually make upgrades work on the control stuff, which I think a lot of teams don't give enough um, enough effort into. Like it's just, it's a, one thing to have a robot program to work and work well, but there's a lot of like controls, tips and tricks that teams can do to kind of optimize how everything's put together, how the robot works, um, how it, can you automate processes that'll make, take small, um, small things that you might, uh, the drivers might make mistakes during the match can you put in a control system that will alleviate that issue? I think if teams focus on doing that um, over the course of the next, like however long until the competitions roll down, roll around, I think that that's a better, um, a better use of their time. And it kind of kills me the whole, like, uh, what's the mechanical team going to do? It's like, oh yeah, you built the best robot in the world. So the mechanical team can just like hang out and do nothing. Like I'm <laughs> sure you can, I'm sure you can figure out some upgrades to make to the robot. Um, but well, yeah, I think, I think Adam hit it on a hit the nail on the head. Yeah, so I got two thoughts based on what Dave was just saying there. Sure. And you know, one, I, I'm a huge 195 fanboy. I think they're a great example to look at here. Uh, because you know, if you didn't know, like if you were looked at isolated parts of a 195 robot and didn't know they were 195, a panel of FRC experts might say like, that system actually looks pretty bad. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> like their 27 intake used four inch wheels. I have no yeah. idea why, probably made sense. That robot was killer. Like they have all these little things that are just kind of weird that you know, people that are maybe more f focused on, on the mechanical side might say like, that's wrong. We need to make a better system. But 195 is like absolutely right with how they're doing it. They get this like pretty good mechanical robot and then just optimize it to all heck and then are a lot better than a lot of teams that have, you know, in theory, maybe a much higher sense of mechanical excellence, um, but then don't compete all that well. And then to expand on what optimization means, like I think most teams have not gone to an event and been absolutely ready, like played 15 matches on the practice day, their drivers, their pit crew, everyone knows exactly what to do. No one's ever uncomfortable. No one ever feels rushed. Like they just look ready. Like that is when, when you're scouting and you see a team that just like looks like they know what they're doing that's what that is usually like that usually isn't just some driver that's crazy good and like there wasn't preparation that went into that like people hit that level of performance because all the details are done and they've done it a whole bunch of times at home um and they're just ready to do it and, and that extends past the drivers you know it's a huge to you know thing to keep a robot running for the whole event and having a well-tuned pit crew which you can usually get from you know maintaining the robot at home um, to make sure it's always ready for that next match is you know a big difference maker. Take one more question and we'll spend about a minute on it because we do have to move on. But uh, from uh, I and I Spade sixty five in chat says, how do you integrate rookie members into a team and keep them uh, interesting if uh, there are no major design changes with the game being played? I just want to say, like, do they know any better? I guess <laughs> like, mm. I, don't, I don't know. How do you guys approach that? That's a great question. You know, we've never approached that before. I. I, I think it, if that rookie member was joining on a team that already had a pretty good sense of competitive excellence, it would just be a non-issue because that team already has a culture that you know designing and making that robot in the first four or five weeks is not what the team is. That is mm -hmm. one aspect of, of many things the team is doing. And like, sure, it might be a bummer that you're not making a new robot that year. I highly doubt any you know healthy team that's organized well is going to have a bad educational experience this next season because there's plenty to focus on and plenty to learn. And that, that's really going to come from the leadership to, to send that message right. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. I think that um, just to quickly go off of that, I think that this this next year will be a really good opportunity for a lot of teams that if they've been trying to get that like student um, student leadership, student driven structure, like now you can take a lot of the students that have had uh, the experience of last se season and know the robot inside and out can work with all of those uh, rookie members to kind of give them the experience and walk them through like, hey, we made this decision. Uh, this is the decision we made and this is how we made it. Uh, and it's a really good time for them to just kind of like a low, a low risk opportunity to get their hands on something that may be a little bit more ambitious than if it was just a regular, regular build season. 
All right, we're going to uh, move on. Uh, by the way, uh, before we do that, uh, we are going to be doing Take From Fun trivia soon for $50. If you're interested in playing, you do need to join the fun Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and join the call in channel queue. Uh, there are only eight spots uh, in there. We will take one of those people in those eight spots. You can do that right now. Uh, and once we're ready to go, you will be challenging Adam to trivia. Uh, so with that said, uh, we want to give our community spotlight uh, here, and we want to give a really uh, big congratulations and a big shout out uh, as well, too, to Adrienne Emerson, uh, who uh, uh, this article was sent over to us. Uh, she was named the uh, uh, Greenville Independent School District Robotics uh, uh, Top Teacher in Texas, uh, sorry, from GISD, uh, Top Teacher in Texas from the Air, Air Force Association. So Big shout out to her. Uh, just to read a little bit out of this, that uh, Emerson was chosen from a group of well-qualified teachers who have demonstrated exceptional ability to motivate students in the science and mathematics disciplines. Uh, the award includes a check for $1,000, a personalized jacket, nice, and a complimentary uh, Civil Air Patrol Aerospace Education membership. So uh, so a big shout out and congratulations uh, to Adrian for uh, being recognized and for being such a fantastic teacher uh, down in Texas, really well deserved. All right, we're going to start our Take From Fun trivia in just a little bit. Um, once again, if you're interested, join the call-in channel queue on Fun Discord. We're going to give that just about a minute uh, before we draw for our caller. Uh, once again, the prize is a $50. It is set as a $50 Amazon gift card. However, if you want something else, that we can make that happen. Uh, so once again, call-in channel queue if you're interested in playing, and we'll be drawing for that in just a minute. Uh, with that said, just a couple rules as we go through here. If you're not familiar with it, for the uh, trivia, it's, we're going to be asking five questions uh, to both uh, the person calling in and to Adam. Adam's going to take off his headphones, actually, uh, during the uh, time, so you can't hear what the questions are. Uh, it is time-based as well, too, for our tiebreaker, uh, so you can't, can't be that person who's trying to search on the Internet for the answer. Trust me, we know when that happens. Uh, OCN, are you there? There we go. Awesome. You ready to play uh, Take From Fun Trivia? Uh, okay, hold up. I have to mute the stream so that I'm not here. Okay, yes, that, that's good. Now, you do realize uh, I do see you have FTC on your name, that these are mostly FRC questions. Oh, yeah. I'm probably going to lose. All right. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> At least he's honest. <laughs> All right. So with that said, uh, uh, we're going to ask uh, once again that Adam takes off his headphones. And Adam, we'll give you a big wave once we're ready to have you uh, come back on. So we'll say goodbye to Adam uh, as it goes through. Uh, and once again, the rules are we're going to have five questions uh, for you to uh, answer. Uh, if you don't know, you can say pass the first time. We will come back to it. Uh, however, if you say pass the second time, that will be the answer we take for that. Once again, this is timed. Uh, so our tiebreaker is whoever has the quickest time will win. This is for $50. Uh, and is, is Ocean, is that how you pronounce it? All right. Are you ready? Uh, sure. All right. Your time begins in three, two, one. Team 51 Wings of Fire was formed by the combination of Team 47 Chief Delphi and what other team? I'm gonna pass. <laughs> All right. Uh, what does the acronym NASA stand for? What four years did Team 254 the Cheesy Poos win Worlds? Uh, let's see. 2019, 2018, 2015, and 2014? Which team has the most amount of championship division wins in FRC history? What is the name of the rocket that launched astronauts Robert Benikin and Douglas Hurley to the International Space Station? They don't care about you. They just care about Victoria. Now she's been um, Saturn V? All right, and last one as we come back to you. I don't think Adam realizes his microphone's still on, but uh, Team 51 Wings of Fire was formed out of a combination of Team 47 Cheat Delphi and what other team? All right, time. <laughs> Let's see if we can get Adam back on here. Oh, well, Shannon, how'd you feel you did? Uh, I think I maybe got zero out of five. Maybe. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Well, we'll give. Uh, we're gonna put you on hold here, and uh, we're gonna give Adam the same 
sets of questions. Uh, so I'm going to ask Dave, if you don't mind, could you just uh, mute your uh, microphone while you're typing real quick? Thank you, yes, sir. sir. Yeah, no worries. All right. So, Adam, five questions. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Your time begins in three, two, one. Team 51 Wings of Fire was formed out of a combination of Team 47 Chief Delphi and what other team? 65. Do you need name, too? Uh, either one is fine. So. Oh, we'll see you know both. All right. All right. What was the acronym NASA stand for? Oh, I might actually get this wrong. National Aeros. I, I'm, I'm going to blow it. I don't know. That's real embarrassing. All right. What four years did 254 the Cheesy Poos win Worlds? 2011, 2014, uh, 2017, 2018. Which team has the most amount of championship division wins in FRC history? Ooh. I think that's 217. What was the name of the rocket that launched astronauts Robert Benkin and Douglas Hurley to the International Space Station? Dragon? Dragon X? And time. All right, let's go through these. Adam, how'd you feel you did? Uh, well, I missed NASA, so that's, that's pretty <laughs> terrible. All right, we'll bring uh, uh, Oceanman back in here, and uh, we'll go through these one at a time. And here we are then. Uh, team 51 Wings of Fire was formed out of a combination of Team 47 Chief Delphi and what other team? Uh, Ocean said pass and then pass again. And uh, Adam said 65 Husky Brigade. Husky Brigade is correct. one nothing uh, for Adam. What does the acronym NASA stand for? Uh, caller uh, Ocean said National Association of Space Aeronautics and uh, Adam said National Aerospace something 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 it is the <laughs> National Aeronautics and Space Administration one nothing mm. for Adam uh, what four years did 254 Cheesy Poos win worlds uh, Ocean said 2019 2018 2015 and 2010 and Adam said 2018 2017 2014 2011 Adam you passed you got that one right that's good to know uh, since you're on the team <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive. I wasn't sure we get that. So, uh, which FRC uh, two nothing, Adam? Which FRC team has the most amount of championship wins in FRC history? Uh, Ocean said. Oh, I thought 70... you said division. I'm sorry, you're yeah, right. Yeah, uh, it was division. Division wins, championship okay. division wins. Sorry, uh, championship division wins. Uh, Ocean said 71, and uh, Adam said 217. 217 is correct. Uh, with that. And what was the name of the rocket that launched astronauts Robert Benkin and Douglas Hurley to the International Space Station? Uh, Ocean said Saturn V, and Adam said Dragon X. It's actually the Falcon 9 is the rocket. Dragon is the space cap. But with that said, Adam is the winner. So unfortunately, Ocean, I'm sorry, not a winner this time. That means $60 goes into our pool for tomorrow uh, and on the FTC. Uh, Ocean, thanks for playing. All right, that's going to end up wrapping up our show as we go through. Adam Hurd, once again, thank you so much uh, for being on and giving us your insight uh, on what's going on in the first community. Anything you want to wrap up with before we end the show? No, 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 no specific thoughts, but thanks so much for having me. It was a good time. Yeah, and David Powers, thanks for being our guest host today. Uh, let us know what's going on with Mechanical Advantage. Um, nothing. Fingers crossed for Sharon. It's <laughs> coming up in a few weeks, but uh, other than that, just living the dream. Absolutely. Well, everybody, uh, with that said, uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on Fun. Talk to you then. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.